What's up, future respiratory therapists? Hey, in this video, we're talking all about nebulization with mechanical ventilation. We're going to do a quick nebulization review and then talk about how do we provide it during mechanical ventilation. Let's dive in. So as I stated, we're talking all about nebulization and mechanical ventilation. Let's get started here with a quick recap of different types of devices related to aerosol generation. Now, um, this is important because as we're going to see here in a little bit, depending on which device you are using, it's going to determine where you're going to put it into the ventilator circuit. And so this is why it's important to review these things. Remember here, we have an example of kind of a standard disposable jet nebulizer. When we look over here, we see that we're talking about um, vibration, which vibration brings us back to our ultrasonic nebulizers and also our vibrating mesh nebulizers. And then when we look over here, we see that we got the good old uh, pressurized meter dosed inhaler. And, and that's the PMDI. Now, what we know is that all of these take liquid and turn it into aerosol, fine particles that we are now going to be breathing in so that we can get these particles, this medication from these devices, whether it's albuterol, ipratropium bromide, or together they make duoneb, or if it's an inhaled corticosteroid or a mucoactive agent, or maybe even some type of pulmonary vasodilator such as Flolan. Whatever it is, you're going to be using some type of device to take that medication from a liquid form to an aerosol form. Now, it's important also to remember right here that we remember where are we trying to get these medications to. Obviously, if you have bronchospasm, you are looking to get these medications down into the deeper and lower airways. That's going to be important. If you're delivering a pulmonary vasodilator, you're looking to try to get these down into the alveolar regions. And so what we know is, is that when we talk about these devices, what comes up is particle size and deposition. And what we know is that particle size is related to deposition. And when we say deposition, we're talking about where do these suspended particles of these uh, aerosolized medications, where do they fall out of suspension and land? That's deposition. Where do they, where do they fall? And, 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 and that's important. Uh, what we see here is that when we're talking about this, we see that 5 to 50 is going to lend its way and probably most likely deposit into the upper airways and the trachea. This is the nose. This is the oropharynx. This is the pharynx, the larynx, and even the trachea. Now, that's typically not where we're trying to get the response of these medications. And you may be asking yourself, well, what is 5 to 50? Well, 5 to 50 is 5 to 50 micrometers. Now, you say, okay, well, what does 5 to 50 micrometers mean? Well, what that is, is that is the MMAD, which is the mass median aerodynamic diameter. And Egan's talks about this, 12th edition, chapter 40, page 843. What we see is, is the MMAD describes the particle diameter in micrometers. In an aerosol distribution with a specific MMAD, this is the key, 50% of the particles are smaller and have less mass and 50% are larger and have greater mass. So if you have an MMAD of 10, then that means that 50% of, of, of all particles, they have a, a, a their, their size and their mass is less than 10 micrometers. And then the other 50% is greater than 10 micrometers. So you can see there where you're going to have a large portion of those particles that are going to deposit in the upper airways and the trachea. So remember that MMAD that you never thought you were going to hear again? Well, you just heard it again now today because it matters. That's what determines the overall size of your, your or, it's, or it's a quantification of the size of the particles that is going to lead you to going, okay, where are we trying to get these drugs to deposit? We see when we go two to five micrometers. We're starting to get into the lower airways. And then when we look at one to three, even down to 0.5, we see that now we're talking about delivery of aerosolized particles down to the alveolar level. This is where they're going to fall out of suspension and deposit. And that's what we're looking for. So you can see here where particle size matters. And, and, and we have to be aware of that. And so that we understand that the devices, when you see the different devices come out that, that talk about different particle sizes, you go, 
That's why it matters to me because I'm the one delivering this medication to my patients. And what is my goal and my objectives from that? Now, the next thing we go from here is go, okay, so we know what devices um, we're using. We know particle sizes. That's all good. But now I need to know where am I supposed to put this into the ventilator? If, am I supposed to put it here? Am I supposed to go on this side of the humidifier? Which side does it go on? And, or maybe it's supposed to go up here closer to the patient. So many different questions on what exactly is best. Well, lucky for you, Egan's page 876, it is going to outline this for you very specifically. And I'm going to illustrate to you exactly what it is saying. Now, here's where it starts with a ventilator without bias flow. So the absence of bias flow. So there you go. Question number one, does my ventilator operate off of a bias flow or not? If it does not, then jet nebulizer devices should be 18 to 24 inches from the patient on the inspiratory limb. So you're going to go, okay, here's the inspiratory limb, and I'm going to go back in this region here. And you say, well, okay, well, well, why? Well, remember, when you have a bias flow or a constant flow running through the circuit, then any aerosol that gathers in here is going to be cleared out by that bias flow. In the absence of bias flow, as this jet nebulizer is generating aerosol particles, they are gathering in this circuit. And upon inspiration, they are delivered to the patient. So that makes sense, right? Well, let's see what another scenario might be. If you have an absence of bias flow, in contrast to what we just saw, in the absence of bias flow, what they find and what they state is, is that pressurized MDIs, ultrasonic nebulizers, and vibrating mesh devices, they should be placed closer to the circuit Y. So they should go in this region. The particles are created smaller. P MDI, you're going to get that one actuation of that aerosol therapy. And what it says is that these devices should be placed closer to the patient at the circuit Y. And that shows an improved deposition associated with these devices closer to the patient. Now, again, Egan's 12 page 876. Now you say, okay, well, what about if we have bias flow? Well, what's recommended that showed the greatest level of deposition was an ultrasonic nebulizer or a vibrating mesh device closer to the ventilator. So you see where we went from, okay, without bias flow, we're going closer to the patient. But with bias flow, we're going closer to the ventilator. So we say, okay, well, 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 what does that mean? Does that mean over here or does that mean over here? Well, let's look and see what the next one says because it doesn't specify, but it does specify literally one sentence later where it says this right here for PCV ventilation with or without bias flow, as well as APRV with and without spontaneous ventilation, delivered dose was greatest with vibrating mesh at the humidifier inlet. So what did that tell us? Oh, that says now we're talking about coming over here because it said at the inlet of the humidifier. Now, this is not a vibrating mesh representation. This is actually a jet nebulizer. What I'm using it to show you is that this is where the inlet to the humidifier is. And so at the inlet of the humidifier is where we should be using a vibrating mesh when we're in pressure control or APRV in the presence of or absence of bias flow, as well as in the presence of or absence of spontaneous breathing where we're talking about APRV. So I think I think this is interesting because I think sometimes we just get in a habit of just doing it all the same. We don't think about which mode. We don't think about I to E ratio. And it's funny because bring up I to E ratio. Um, uh, Egan says it here on page 875, it says when nebulizer output, humidity level, tidal volume, flow, and I to E ratio are optimized, deposition can increase up to 15%. When not optimized, we know, and when we don't think of these things, what we know is that deposition ranges anywhere from about one and a half to 3%. Straight out of Egan's right here, one and a half to 3%. So interesting. So we, we need to, we need to, Keep that in mind. Now, something else here I want to talk to you about because there was just uh, recently I learned about an article that came out in Chess back in uh, 2023, and it says that a filter should be attached to the expiratory limb of the ventilator circuit to capture 
exhaled aerosol. I'm talking about this filter right here. Now we always know that we're gonna, we're obviously gonna filter the inspiratory limb, right? You don't want, uh, you obviously want to filter any gas that is going to your patient, as well as any any potential debris from the inner workings of the ventilator. We want to filter all that. That that makes perfect sense. But what about the expiratory side? We see what they found here is is that when we are aerosolizing medication without a filter, believe it or not. There is environmental exposure that happens. I'm going to read uh, uh, one sentence out of this article to you uh, from my extra screen over here. Here's what it says. Without filters, bystanders were at risk of being exposed to 45% of the nominal dose of the aerosol compared with 0.25%. Expiratory limb filter reduces environmental exposure and hazards associated with aerosol therapy during mechanical ventilation. Not just environmental exposure, but it also reduces the amount of aerosol particles that return back to the ventilator that can impair and impede the, the, the accuracy of the ventilator in regards to pressure and flow and volumes. And so we understand that protecting the vent and the environment for which we exist in and for which visitors exist in is important, which is why an expiratory filter is valuable. All right, I want to talk about this one more thing because Egan's does mention that a heat and moisture exchanger should be considered a barrier to aerosol administration during mechanical ventilation. So what it's saying here is if you are using an HME or perhaps an HMEF, such as what's illustrated here, this is the Pole Orthopore 100. And this is an HMEF. It's a heat moisture exchanger as well as a filter. Now, what you're seeing here is incorrect. You would not want to administer a nebulizer into the inspiratory limb. No, nowhere in this limb would be correct when you have an HME at the circuit wide because all of this aerosol is just going to get captured into this filter. It's not going to have a chance to make it to the patient. So we have to, we have to, uh, realize that it can't go there. This is incorrect. What is correct is when you have your nebulizer device between the artificial airway and the HME. Now what's going to happen is aerosol is produced during inspiration. It is carried down into your patient. And then on exhalation, we come back through in the HME, HMEF, functions as it's supposed to. Now, here's the other cool kicker here. Upon exhalation, all of these aerosol particles in and within the dead space are going to be exhaled back out and captured right here, which means the next time the breath comes in, the next inspiratory phase, some of these particles can be recaptured and recarried down to your patient. So remember that always, if you're using a heat moisture exchanger or specifically a Paul HMEF, then you want to make sure that your nebulizer is between the HMEF and the artificial airway. And that is an important component. Otherwise you're just wasting your time and we don't want to do that. So that's aerosol delivery during mechanical ventilation. Don't sleep on the value of filtration when we talk about this because we must protect our patients. We also must protect ourselves and the equipment we are working with and understanding how aerosol and filtration works together. Extremely important. Hey, I'm Respiratory Coach. Stay here with me on YouTube. Hit the like, subscribe, leave me a comment on this video. How do you administer aerosolized medication to and for your mechanically ventilated patients? Where do you put the nebulizer in the circuit? Come find me on Instagram, TikTok, at Respiratory Coach, LinkedIn, at Joe Lewis. And then finally, send me an email if you have any questions, respiratorycoach at gmail.com. Hey, do me a favor. Be sure to check out the video description below. I'm going to link to that chest article that I referenced in here so that you can read it and educate yourself on why expiratory filters are so important during mechanical ventilation, specifically related to aerosol administrations. Hey, remember at the end of the day, average is easy. Don't be it.